What's up, dude? How you doing, man? Thank you so much for being on here. It means a ton. I, I can't I can't express how much it means for you to come on here and talk about where you've been and what you're doing. And uh, so without me botching it up, why don't you go ahead and tell everybody uh, your name and uh, where you're from and what you do? Um, well, definitely. Thank you for having me on. This is truly an honor, Jay. This uh, common dude uh, is totally what's needed right now. Um, my name is James Laster. Um, I am a financial planner, financial advisor here in the Northern Virginia area, right outside of DC. Uh, born and raised in Wilmington, North Carolina. I actually went to the same high school. Michael Jordan went to EA Laney High School. Um, just, just had a riot of a time growing up as a little kid, hanging out at the beach almost every night uh, and then making it to class in the morning. So yeah, now we're on grown man status. <laughs> awesome man well uh well let's go ahead and dive into it so what we're gonna do is i'm gonna ask you a series of questions and then uh at the end guys don't forget if you have a question for him just go ahead and prefix your question with a question mark so we know it is geared towards uh my man james and uh so let's go ahead and get started so you said where you grow you grew up in wilmington north carolina i live that's where we met uh wonderful place uh it's booming in, in film right now, um, which is yeah. which is insane. But uh, go ahead and tell everybody like what your childhood was like. What was it like growing up in Wilmington? <laughs> uh, Wilmington has a has a crazy past and a crazy history. Um, just being uh, kind of like a watering hole for a lot of people inside of the area. Um, me personally, as I grew up, I grew up. Uh, maybe 10 or 15 minutes, uh, depending on traffic, what time of day from Wrightsville Beach. Uh, so for me as a kid, um, it consisted of either hanging out at the beach or, or hanging out with friends. I'm a former musician, um, former trumpet player, uh, played a little bit of trombone, uh, played uh, percussion, picked up guitar, uh, piano, um, just, just anything that was needed to get the groove going. Uh, and, and, and obviously, you know, I, I did go to uh, school for music uh, at North Carolina Central University, also attended U, uh, UNC Wilmington um, uh, for college, for, for musical studies. Um, but my, my, my love of music uh, started all the way back in middle school in Wilmington. And ever since then, you know, uh, you know, going to church with my mom and just trying to be able to play the songs that they were playing in church. And so I can know if they messed up or not. <laughs> it was kind of uh, how I started in music and pretty much what I did as a kid. I, I think I think music because music kept me uh, out of a lot of things. I know I probably <laughs> would have been involved in had it, had it not been for music. So, yeah, that, that was me in a nutshell from Wilmington, North Carolina. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome yeah same here man i think uh music definitely kept me out of a lot of bad things for sure um so so i know you went into education uh how did you first know you wanted to you know impart knowledge on uh on younger folks <laughs> well <laughs> How did I know I wanted to go into education? Um, it, it was a sequence of events, and the biggest event was uh, uh, the birth of my firstborn son. Um, I, at the time, I was gigging all over. Any, any gig I can get, uh, I was just because I wanted to play. I love music. Uh, but uh, gigging does not pay the bills. <laughs> uh, gigging did not have... Um, it did not have benefits go to the doctor right um so when my you know my oldest son was born that that was kind of like okay uh game one and i was already in school uh at the time for um, a degree in education i mean a, a degree in music performance um and i noticed i just need to take uh, four or five more classes and okay i can go ahead and get my education degree so that's what i did i just loaded it up uh, I had a couple semesters where I had 21 credit hours to go through. Uh, that made it happen. Made it happen. Awesome. So, so what? So what happened after that? Like, what did you end up doing? Well, um, a, a couple of things. So, so one of the first things that that I did is uh, one of my first jobs. 
um, out of college uh, were at two nonprofit organizations uh, and they were both um, uh, institutes for the arts and, and dreams inside Wilmington, North Carolina. Definitely go check it out because I, I, I'm one of the few people that helped lay the groundwork for that. But uh, what happened at, there was I had the ability to uh, start teaching kids all the way from pre-K all the way up to uh, sixth grade. I began teaching them music, uh, teaching them drums, teaching them vocals, um, uh, doing recordings, teaching guitar. So as you can probably tell, I'm an all-in guy. And the, the thing about when, me, when I got started into music is there was a lot of things I had to be honest with myself and, and, and say, hey, I don't know this. And so what I would do is I would go out and while I'm teaching one instrument, I'm learning another because I'm trying to stay ahead of, my, uh, of all of my kids. Uh, those kids were smart. And so they kept pushing me, pushing me, pushing me uh, to the point where I started teaching there Right. And while I was teaching, I was also gigging with this cool band. It was called Fat Ellis. You got to check it out, by the way. Um, and we were we were traveling and playing in the evening. And during the daytime, I was, you know, obviously teaching and trying to figure out what time during that time, spend time with my my wife and my my newborn son at the time. So, yeah, that's that's James in a nutshell, man. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So how rewarding was it to be able to teach? kids music and see uh see them grow in in those in in that space oh man so anybody in education would tell you it's a delayed gratification effect meaning that you go through all the obstacles of trying to figure out how a student learns and once you understand how the student learns uh then you start making progress. You don't want to make progress too fast. You don't want to go too slow, but just keeping someone on track to the point is that they're not even realizing that they're making progress. So the delayed gratification always comes towards the end of the school year where that light bulb comes on. They're like, ah, oh, I got it. And that's, that's the pride you get as a teacher because, hey, I took you from point A to point B and you probably could have got there without me, but I'm, I'm one of the primary reasons above, over and above your own parents, your own friends, that success. I, I do have a stake and a share inside that success. And so that was, uh, that right there was part of the biggest thing uh, in education, as well as just the different personalities. So when I started teaching, I started teaching um, in Montgomery County, uh, in Maryland, uh, as well as Fairfax County, two of the biggest and, and most notarized, uh, uh, notable uh, school districts inside of the United States. And for me to be able to do curriculum content, to do uh, testing, um, and just really just jump in, just really jump in and absorb all of that, making those rela relationships with the professionals that, and colleagues I was working at, uh, the parents that I were, I still keep in contact with a lot of those parents. It was really weird is when I would drive around town. I, uh, right now, a lot of kids are going back to school, going back to college. If I go inside uh, a grocery store, some, I'm seeing students. And when you calculate the time that I was, that I was a teacher at the time, I've taught over, I've touched over 12,000 kids because I was the music teacher. And I taught pre-K pre -K all the way up to high school. Wow. Awards, award-winning programs all over the place, but to be able to make those relationships, still have those relationships, and then watch kids that I taught music in kindergarten and 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 in first and second grade, they're now getting scholarships <laughs> for music, right? That's crazy. So uh, it's, it's it's just it's just really cool just to just to lay the groundwork for a lot of uh, success. Wow. Um, so there seems to be a lot of correlation between education and what you're doing now. So how did you make that transition? Like what inspired you to get into to, to financial advising? Oh, uh, so story goes, I'm teaching, all is going well. Um, and then I have to go out on, on uh, disability. Well, before I went out on disability, I received all of my credentials, um, uh, master of Education and Supervision uh, to become a school principal. All right? That's why I thought, hey, that's, that's going to be my deal. That, that's, that's what I'm going to do. 
And I, I will never forget the story. Um, it was six weeks before the end of the school year. And I remember uh, the school teacher, um, I won't say his name, but he was saying that his daughter was getting married in Wilmington, North Carolina. I said, well, I'm from Wilmington. I said, well, she's getting married. He goes, Arlie Gardens. He goes, oh my God, Arlie Garden is beautiful. I, I performed numerous weddings and bar mitzvahs at Arlie, Ar Ar Arlie Garden. And he goes then to disclose like, man, my, my, my daughter's, uh, uh, the, the, the groom's family are going to be taking care of the wedding because I obviously couldn't do it. I was just going to tell her, you know, go to the barn and, you know, <laughs> we're going to get married. And at that point, I realized this guy is getting an award. And this is this, you know, uh, it, towards the end of the year. So I heard the story six weeks before. So uh, towards the end of the school year. He's getting a pen for 27 years of school teaching. He gets a cup. He gets a ring. They give him a, a, a and I saw him print the certificate on a regular piece of paper, right? And I and, and immediately hit me. I said, in 27 years, this cannot be James. It can't. So fast forward, I go on disability, and I'm still helping teachers as well as parents, all with financial concerns. Um, you know, you know, you know, you know, whether, you know, some people are getting evicted out of their house. Uh, some people, um, their, their parents passed away and they inherited money. And, and I'm just trying to be resourceful. And what I've always done since a little kid, I walked with people through their adversities. And each time, you know, our relationships has grown, but I've learned through that. So what really propelled me into the financial advising and financial services industry was the fact that Throughout my timeline, throughout my life, there was always a financial issue of why there was a problem. And if we can get to the root of whatever financial issue that there is, you know, there was, then it's a win-win for everybody. And the best part about it, it that propelled me into just researching is that uh, I realized really quickly that people were going through situations, but they were not the first ones to go through those situations. So finding people or finding uh, uh, scenarios where somebody with the light like client has gone through a similar situation and, and kind of study, hey, what, what worked here, what didn't work, is, is, is really what kind of like said, okay, James, this is for you. That plus I kept getting teachers and parents saying, you shouldn't be a school principal, you should do this for a living. <laughs> and when I got my first big paycheck, I was like, oh my God. <laughs> Let's do it. Go time. So, yeah, that's that's how I ended up in the uh, professional services, uh, the professional financial services industry. That's wow. kind of how it came. That's amazing. So, what what training did you have to do to get to become a financial advisor? Oh well, so everybody's path is a little bit different. I'm a very unorthodox guy. A, a lot of what I learned, I had to learn on my own or through another resource. So the training that I received is first and foremost, um, I studied for my life, health, and annuities license. That's the beginning of all financial planning, right? Um, because you want to protect what you have, and how do you, you know, how do you protect your income? How do you protect your money? So you got to understand those products at minimum, right? In healthcare, um, and from there, uh, obviously, there's some CE credits that you always have to take. But uh, I personally went through American College for uh, their uh, Chartered uh, Financial Planner Program, which is very good. Anybody looking to get in the industry, that's where you go. And that's where you understand to work with business owners, um, whether, whether you're a government employee, it, it doesn't matter. But understanding estate planning, uh, college planning, uh, personal financial planning, the risk assessments that go along with all those things. Um, how to add in healthcare, how to add in uh, longevity, mortality rates, and understanding what's your true cost. What's your true cost of, of, of you just living? What's your true cost of your household? What's your true cost of your business? What's your true cost of retirement? And then develop a plan and work yourself backwards from based upon the lifestyle that you want. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, and I know this, this it can probably be a topic that a lot of people don't want to look at it, don't want to face, but, but it's, I know it's how important it is, especially the older you get. So, I mean, have you had to convince people how important it is to, uh, to prepare for the inevitable essentially? 
Have I had to convince people? Yeah. I don't convince people of anything. And the reason why I say that is because when you're convincing somebody into doing something, that sells, mm -hmm. right? I'm an educator. I educate you. I have some of the most informed clients in the industry, right? So I, I'm, I'm always educating. I'm always emailing out, you know, different um, uh, articles, uh, news flash, like um, uh, this morning, I, I spent some time uh, at 5.30 in the morning sending out articles for clients who have money inside the market. They're concerned about the, 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 the China trade war and how is it affecting their portfolio? What does that look like? Uh, what things do they need to do? So it's all about educating. And then that's when I have people saying, hey, I'm convinced based upon what I've read that I should be doing this or I should be doing that. What direction do you think I need to go there? Um, when it, but when you use the word convincing, that word convincing is more pushed towards uh, those folks that are, shall I say, millennials that are, that are a little bit younger, right? Uh, because the fact of the matter is right now, well over half, and it's about 80% of America does not have a retirement savings. They don't have a rainy day fund. They don't have the, the three to six months saved up and everything is on credit. It's, it, it's all on credit. And so many people are swiping. And I think one of the, the, the biggest curse is a gift and a curse uh, in the American economy is the credit card, is, mm -hmm. is the debit card. Because I like cash. I'm a cash guy. I, I, I don't talk about how much cash, but I'm a cash guy because I, I can feel it. I know how much I have. But when people are just swiping the cards, one of the things that I do inside my consultation, I say, well, so tell me how much money you need to live, you know, uh, uh, you know, a month. Very few people can tell. People mm -hmm. just spin, 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 right? Well, here's the thing. In 2015, spring 2015, you can look it up. Time Magazine put out an article. And on that article, it says that kids being born today have the ability, and this is what stem cell and genetic research, they have the ability to live to age 142. So the question I got to ask people that are younger, do you intend to be working well into your 80s or your 90s? Yes or no? Hmm. They say no. Well, it doesn't look like it. I, I don't care what you tell me. I look at actions and your actions are saying you're not saving anything. You're not even thinking about it. None of your actions are saying, hey, I'm preparing for a rainy day. I'm preparing for the future. And so there's not really a need for convincing after you give folks, you know, the truth. You have to, you give them the fact, right? Numbers don't lie. Hmm. Yeah, that's a good point, though. Like, it's people, you, you shouldn't have to convince convince them that. They, they need to realize that on their own, and then, and then you can work with them a little bit more closely on uh, how to plan. That's, that's, that's a good way to put it. I like that. Um, so w what struggles did you have to go through when you were just a budding entrepreneur? Like when you were just trying to get your business up and running, were there any major hurdles that you had to jump over to, to become as successful as you are now? Struggles. <laughs> how much time we got, bro? <laughs> uh, uh, we, we got enough. We got enough. Go ahead. Give us a spill. Um, and because this is a platform, I, I don't know who's listening and I'm a giver. I, I, I've learned uh, through many resources, just give, just give and it comes back to you. So uh, some of my struggles, um, living on commissions opposed to a salary, right? Um, some people get excited when they make a sale. It doesn't matter. And I work a lot of business. Owners. It doesn't matter what you're selling, what product or service that you're selling. You only are getting paid for what you earn. So if you're in business for yourself, I had to learn that I got to, you know, I knew I had to get up every day and go work, but it took a while for me to re for it to really hit home and say, Hey, I got to stay consistent. I got to stay consistent because just because I got this client or just because I wrote this deal doesn't mean that the client may, oh, I want a refund or, oh, you know, or, or this deal may not go through. And definitely when you're in the financial services industry, all clients may not uh, uh, qualify 
uh, through suitability to get certain products. So when I learned that people are, 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 are don't uh, become clients uh, because they have money, they become clients because they have good health. That was a big, a big, big deal for me. You know, so living off commission versus salary, salary. Hey, I know that this amount of money is coming every single month. Commission, okay. <laughs> so, so that, and so the other thing was is like savings versus credit. That was the other struggle that I had. Um, I had huge issues dealing with credit. Because I was putting so much on my, my credit card and I wasn't saving, right? So, you know, working in the financial industry, you can only go so long making minimum payments and then, okay, that APR of your credit card is like going to kick your butt, right? Um, so, so making sure that there's savings, you know, emergency savings for a rainy day was, was another struggle. Um, the, the, the other... The, one another huge struggle that I personally had, and I think a lot of people have when you're going into business for yourself, is understanding the need to have systems. Just just making sure that you have a system because it serves as a great checks and balance. And when you have a system in there, God forbid you get sick, or even if you wanted to hire somebody or you wanted to mentor somebody, something that's something I like to do. You got to have a system. You got to train somebody through a system. And if you don't have a system, then a lot of of the details uh, and the level of quality that you won't fall through the cracks. And within that system, you got to know your numbers. That's, a, that's another thing. Um, uh, classic example, when I'm telling people, hey, how much do you need monthly uh, for your household? Well, some of those people who have bad habits in their own household, they bring them inside their business. And that's not good. <laughs> because if you make a promise to a client, you got to be able to follow through on your promise because you're only as good for uh, uh, yeah, as your word, right? Um, the 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 other thing was is a struggle that I had is I had to realize that everybody can't be my client. I had to suck it up and realize I have to have a niche. I have to have a certain clientele that I'm just going to specialize in. That's the type of client for me. If you're if you fit this mold, you're going to be great as my client. I'm going to take really good care of. And I, it was a hard uh, pill for me to swallow and, and digest because I can't help everybody. That's not my niche. I can get and refer you to somewhere, but I, that's not my niche. Um, understanding forms of marketing was another huge uh, struggle for me. I, I wasted a lot of money marketing in the wrong places because once again, I didn't understand my niche and I didn't put my foot down and say, hey, this is going to be my niche. Um, the other thing that I've struggled with that I've seen other business owners struggle with is, is, is the art of thinking too big, right? Go ahead and think big. The sky's the limit. I get it, right? But when you're thinking big, didn't, and for me, I had to learn to take constructive criticism. I, I had to be able to hear somebody say, hey, this needs to be tweaked. This needs, well, this is not working out. You know, it's a little clunky here. You know, we got to fix this hmm. and being able to discern who I'm going to take my criticism for, right? Just because somebody give you your criticism, you always got to be prudent enough to say, okay, hey, is this good information or not? Okay, where did this information come from? What does the, this person right here have to gain or lose by telling me what they just said? So you have to be discernful in that matter. And then just facing the reality that, hey, what you're doing is not working or how you're doing is not working. Because if you're honest with yourself and receiving that criticism, then things tend to shake out a lot sooner <laughs> than just letting it go through uh, time and time. And then I guess my, my, if I had to give one more, one more huge struggle, mm -hmm. it was balance. It is, it is balance. I'm trying to be a perfectionist with my clients and with my family and with my, my extracurricular uh, miscellaneous time, you know, my James time, as well as cultivate those relationships. Um, and I, because I'm a shark, right? I'm, I'm going, okay, who do I help? Who do I help? Who do I need to help? Who do I need to help? I get so focused on that. It's, it's a huge struggle. And even to the day, I, I, that's why I have a planner and, and a calendar and agenda, multiple reminders. Those are huge struggles that I, I personally have and I've seen other people. Wow. Um, yeah, that's, that's definitely, I think the balance thing catches a lot of people off guard is 
you know, especially, you know, doing that with the, having a good family life. Cause I've heard other people say like, they know people that make a ton of money and are just miserable just because they don't have a solid family life, you know, or like they've gotten divorced because they didn't spend enough time with their, you know, spouse or whatever. But, uh, yeah, that's a good point. Um, Dude, I've been married to my wife 24 years, okay? 24 years. This, this lovely, beautiful woman of mine, all right, has had my back since day one. And I owe it to her to make sure that I'm giving back to her and giving back to my wife and kids, all right? And to the point where I turned down speaking engagements, I, I've turned down a whole bunch of other things because you know what? Who am I to gain the whole world <laughs> and lose everything, lose my soul, lose my family and everything. And, you know, to get back to the other question, when, when you say, okay, what were your struggles? One of my struggles was developing my why. Like, why am I doing all these things? What, you know, why do I want to do this uh, beyond the money, right? Money, because money is just a tool to get something else, right? And that balance a family and, 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 and wife. And if you study, if you study some of the, the, the wealthiest people in the world, not just America, the wealthiest people in the world, one of the biggest things that is in common with all of them is that they have a prayer meditation life and they are married to the same woman uh, uh, for, for well over 20, 30 years. Well over 20, 30 years. Hmm. And they, they, they are extremely wealthy. And as well as those folks that are staying married, not only are they living longer, but their wealth is lasting longer for generation upon generation upon generation. And so just the research in the financial services and in the financial industry, those things have helped me just better form, uh, form my why, uh, why I do some of the things I do. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so how is your profession needed in the current marketplace right now like what are you seeing like out of your clients that that the main cause for them to to need a financial advisor well well first things first they don't teach this in high school they don't teach it in college and sometimes in college they do have those classes but nobody's signing up to take them mm. And, when, and in the college courses, and I'm a former educator, I've helped a lot of kids get into college, right? And I've looked at the curriculums and those things, uh, personal finance, it, it's an elective, right? Hmm. And when you're in college, you're just trying to take your core classes and get out of there, right? So why is what I do heavily needed? I'll start from the beginning and I go to the ending, right? Number one, people, the, the two of the biggest debts that, most of America has is college debt and credit card debt, right? College debt and credit card debt, the two biggest things. I got clients that are 60, 63, 67, and 68. These are two clients I saw last week. They're just now paying off their college loan. Just now, college loans, right? So if you're paying, and it's income-based payment, so if you're paying that all in college loans, imagine what your quality of life is or what it could be, if you had planned, uh, you had a plan in pay, place where you could pay off your college debt for you know five, seven, or ten years, right? Um, the reason why this is very important right now, I, it, once again, if you watch the news in the past couple of days, this China trade war scared a lot of people. Two thousand eight people lost thirty eight percent out of their retirement savings. It's like right at forty percent. Okay. We're in a bull market right now, and they're anticipating, they're prepping, they're bracing themselves that people will lose this time, the next time the market resets, 42% out of your retirement savings. 42%. Whoa. Right? So the reason why what I do is so important is that, number one, nobody wants to be in debt. All right. There's a lot of shame. There's a lot of guilt. There's a lot of remorse being in debt. People are in debt for reasons. They, they, they bought things that don't even know why they bought it. Right. They, they had a great dinner. They've already pooped it out. But the remains is still there 10, 12 and 15 years after. Right. Um, 
how, how would, why, the reason what I do is so important. Let's say you, you know, you're married and you have a spouse and you have a kid. God forbid you get in a car accident tomorrow. How are your wife and your kid going to fare? Right? You got to talk with a financial professional. What about if you get a, some type of ailment, uh, you know, cancer is very regular or, or, you know, you get some type of rare disease. You're not going to get treated in today's healthcare laws unless you got a little bit of money, right? Imagine all the, uh, and then, and then um, even more, the federal spend now is really, it's huge, right? So God forbid you have a medical emergency and, and you need some type of procedure. Uh, I'll use cancer again. You can pay over a quarter million dollars without any insurance for a cancer, right? Well, ethically, they're going to help you out. Hmm. Live or die, they're going to help you out. But they're going to use your assets as collateral, right? So if you're paying on a house, if you got a diamond ring, if you got money inside a bank account, the IRS has the power to go in and get their money back. Meanwhile, the main reason why what I do is so important, uh, we're, 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 we're not old enough to realize the realities of what was happening in the 1920s in America. It was not uncommon for people to be driving down the street and see an old dead man or old dead woman on the side of the road because nobody had a retirement savings. People did not understand uh, the relevance of uh, having financial planning inside their lifestyle. They thought it was always something for the affluent to have. Really, the less money you have, the more financial advice you need, right? Um, and just to think about, people had ended up inside nursing homes and all other types of situations that they would not have chosen on their own, but they were forced into it because of lack of financial planning, right? Look, it is what it is. Um, I have clients right now who are starting off and they're paying themselves $50 a week, $50 a week, you know, uh, you know, uh, or, or shall I say, uh, if, they, if they get paid, you know, if they're working a 40 hour work shift, they're taking one or two hours from that paycheck and setting it aside and they're putting inside different accounts. And yeah, they're growing their money. They're growing their money. So. Um, what I do is that important because people don't understand the time value of money and how it's going to affect their overall fitness. Hmm. Yeah, that's that's a scary thought, especially if uh, you know you're not prepared. Like anything, anything can happen. You know, anything. And if you're not prepared financially, like you could be burden uh, putting the burden on the people you love the most. That's that's a scary thought. Um, so how long, like when you start working with a client? to when you call it quits? Like how long is that process? Um, it all depends. Um, but I normally have a four step process with, with all my clients. And, you know, the first step is, is obviously an evaluation. Um, I, I want to know about you, right? You're more than just a number. I'm, I'm looking to make a long-term relationship opposed to a wham, bam, thank you, man, okay? Uh, number two, after we've had that evaluation, we're going to have a discovery meeting. Um, we're going to talk about what we discovered. Um, and then I'm going to provide some, some uh, recommendations. Okay. And I customize all my recommendations based upon that evaluation and then the initial uh, feeling and understanding of everything that occurred. Um, then number three, we, you know, we sit down, we do some contract signing, uh, we, we, we talk about uh, what everything means, um, how to use whatever financial products they use. And then the, 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 you know, the fourth step, um, and this is within anywhere between a four to six week time frame. Um, we're just doing, a, you know, an annual review where we're doing our first follow-up review. And that's when, um, in my firm, everything is, is, uh, shall I say paperless, right? So you can go online, you can look at all your accounts, you can look at all your spending right there online. You just use the last financial app, just click on it and boom, uh, put your fingerprint in. You're good to go. You see all, everything. So that takes about four to six weeks from start to finish from four to six weeks to just work with a client and to develop their plan and then implement their plan. Hmm. That's uh, four to six weeks. Huh? That's, that's pretty good though. Like, you, I, I feel like you could really get to know who you're working with 
in, in about that time. Um, and then, I mean, did they keep reaching out to you afterwards? Like, like how do they keep staying in touch? Oh God. Yeah. Because well, all of their accounts is, 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 is consolidated. I'm, I'm one of the few firms that offer this, right? Um, number two, I, I have client retreats. So when you're my client, um, I, I either pay for it out of the firm or you get a very reduced uh, uh, price to events uh, uh, you know, within this area that we can go to. Um, any, anything from you know, a cruise in DC, a, you know, theater dinner or so forth. Uh, or or, or um, I'm looking forward to our, our first company cruise. Uh, we're setting that up for 2020. Um, awesome. But, you know, a lot of my clients are seniors, they're retired, so they got time on their hands. And um, I use that as a company write off to go see another area that maybe I want to buy some property. <laughs> <laughs> hey, let's do a retreat. Let's go. You know, that's um, awesome. But clients, yeah, I, I sometimes something will make me think of a client. I'll just text a client. Hey, how's it going? Um, and I'm very relational that way. And I have clients that do the same thing. They have my direct line. Once you become my client, they have my direct line. So I reach out to clients, clients reach out to me on an ongoing basis. Oh, that's, that's cool. All right. So what are some of your business and personal aspirations for the next, I don't know, three to five years? Business and personal. Well, that's a, <laughs> that's a good question. Um, well, first and foremost, I have some marriage goals. Um, I've been married 24 years. Uh, I like to keep it spiced up, Right. Um, not do anything too crazy, right? But I'm 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 on a search this year because uh, this coming April is going to be our 25th uh, wedding anniversary. Oh wow! So, so I want to do something really, really special, um, relational wise, um, not, not necessarily on the romantic side, just just to be close, but something closer to my wife. Um, I do got some workout goals um, that. Because I've noticed that the stress level, I take on other people's stress. So I, I want to make sure that I'm working out um, uh, properly. And once again, that's another relationship goal. I think my wife deserves a husband with a six pack. Uh, <laughs> man, six packs are I'll, I'll give her a double deuce, you know? <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're overrated, man. Don't worry about it. <laughs> um, but business-wise, um, uh, I... I, I'm looking to be fully secure. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to work hard to be fully securities licensed. I'm always referring people out where to go and how to set up a brokerage account. And I just, it, it just be a whole lot easier if I just did it in house. So uh, obviously there's some, you know, uh, qualifications. You got to go through that, some testing. Um, I'm a great test taker. That's not an issue. It's just, you know, working in the time that, that that's going to happen. Um, I'm also looking to like mentor about 30 people. Um, I want to give back because I remember when I was teaching, I was constantly learning even more because I'll have students ask me questions. I have to think about my response. Why is it that I do the things that I do? Um, you know, put that in writing and, and, you know, do it verbally. So right now what I really like to do is start working on uh, just trying to mentor uh, on a six week cycle, 30 people just, hmm. to just be able to give back and see, and see what's possible. See what's possible. Yeah. You, you always learn the most teaching, man. I, I know you know that for sure. Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And it is, it's, yeah. it's nothing like planting seeds, right? And yeah. forget to plant them yeah. and then come back like, Oh <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, so it, it, that, that, that's that's good. That's good. That's awesome. Good. So, uh, one of my last questions before we get to Q and A's because we have quite a few today. Um, but so, in my space, like streamers or uh, YouTubers or or uh, you know people like content creators, like, do you have any advice for when they they start to monetize? Like, what would be the first thing that they need to do with their income? For streamers with their with their income, yeah, YouTubers like live streamers, uh, like they get sponsored or they you know they get they brand deals or something like that. Listen to me when I say this, <laughs> okay. One of the biggest things that people need to do when they start getting their money, all right. Let's say your first three hundred bucks. Stop, 
and go register your business, whether it's going to be an LLC, an S Corp or a C Corp, go register your business. Don't do that sole proprietor stuff. Uh, because if you look at the tax laws, the tax laws are, are more generous to LLCs and, and, and S Corps and C Corps, mainly C Corp. Okay. If you're just starting out, get an LLC, you'll be fine. Why? You can get sued. <laughs> right. And why? Because you need you need to be able to write off uh, a bunch of things. Um, I I'll give you a classic example. Classic example. Um, I was working uh, um, with, uh, and I won't say names, but uh, someone who has ambitions to become mayor of Fort Lauderdale. And since the new uh, tax laws have been out, he went down to go register a new LLC. Well, when he went to go register the new LLC when it normally took 24 to 48 hours to be registered, they told him on average right now it's 15 to 20 days to get your business registered. What is that telling you? Everybody is realizing that if you are not incorporated, have an LLC, C Corp, or S Corp, you're going to pay a whole lot more in taxes and have less things to write off. So now I want you to think about it. If you immediately go ahead and get an LLC or C Corp or S Corp, and you're making a little bit of money. Now you can take that money and pour it back inside your business to grow your business so you can scale your business and you can write it off. You can take losses. Now I'm not giving tax advice, but it's nothing like getting a check <laughs> at the end of the year because you were a business owner and you did not just do it out of your own pocket. What comes along with that as well and in incorporating your business, uh, the close number two that I would say is uh, open up your business account, banking account, and start building your business credit. We know about consumer credit, but when you start building that business credit, you, you'll get a high value, uh, uh, a high credit limit credit card. So when you need to make those decisions and make those purchases on behalf of your business, your business doesn't have to stop until you get one, two, three, or five clients. No, you can keep on working and get those clients without skipping a beat because now you have business credit. Hmm. That's awesome. That's awesome advice. I think, I think more people in our industry need to hear that for sure. Um, and I'll direct them to you, James. If, uh, if anybody asks, I'm gonna be like, go talk to that man. But, uh, let's get to the Q and a, cause we got a bunch. Um, are there Q and a questions? I don't see any. I'll let you ask me. All right. So, uh, one of our, one of my favorite people that have been in our chat is, uh, his name's Lulu. He asked, I was unemployed for eight months last year and have been unemployed for over a month now. At what point should I file for unemployment? I'll get an interview and I think I don't need unemployment, but then the job falls through. I have no debt and I am a good saver. So I have been able to survive at this point. So at what point do you file for unemployment? Yeah. See, see, that all depends. Is, you know, is he disabled or did he get laid off? Did he get fired? Right? Mm, yeah. Um, and, and, I, and I've seen all scenarios and understand I, I walk with people, this is my disclaimer, I've walked through a, with a lot of people through a lot of financial issues. So there's probably two or three ways I can answer that question. So, so here we go. If you're on disability and you need that unemployment, like you should have did that like yesterday, okay? Um, but number two, close second, is if you are receiving, uh, I mean, if you are not receiving unemployment benefits, my recommendation would be get your unemployment benefits and then go take a course because the financial aid is very lenient at that point so that you can go get the skills or, or, or whatever that you need or enhance your skills. And there's funding, uh, there's federal funding for those things. You just got to look for them, right? So when you go to file unemployment, you go ahead and file the unemployment, but then when you're filing the, uh, for the unemployment, go ahead and, and, and increase your skill base. Now, what do you do with that unemployment money? Uh, obviously, that should be for you to live on. But no matter how much you get, no matter how much you get, 20% you're stashing. No matter how much you get, you got $100, no, you got $80. 
Okay, you get a thousand dollars, you only got eight hundred dollars. You're constantly stashing. Keeps. If you don't get anything else from what I'm saying, stash <laughs> cash, <laughs> stash cash. Trust me. Yeah. Just, just trust me on that point. Just stash cash, right? But just so put it in the mattress. Is that what you're saying? Well, well, I, I would not necessarily put it in the mattress. A brokerage account would probably be a better uh, choice for me. You can do anything. You, I mean, you really cheap fees and everything. Fidelity. Schwab, TD Ameritrade, just put a couple dollars in there and just be consistent and then let it grow, right? Don't get too greedy and try to grow it too fast. Just, just little by little, just keep it in there. Just, 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 keep, just trust me on this. Why? Because the interest will grow your money. That's, that, see, that's, that's people don't understand that. And I'm going to touch on just a little bit and then I'm going to back off. When you put your money inside the bank right now, one of the best rates I've seen has been like, you know, 0.5%. Mm -hmm. And if it's a money market account, meaning they're going to lock your money up for a whole six months or a year or two, two years, then you're getting 1%, maybe 1.5 or 2%, but they just dropped interest rates. So maybe you're getting 1% of your money. Rather, you put it in a brokerage account, but now you can start seeing on average about 11, 13%. Just grow your money. Just grow it. That's, that's good advice. Um, all right. So next question. Do you have to be wealthy to need a financial advisor? No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> Broke people need financial advisement. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Because, because, because there's all kinds of broke, man. Oh. I, 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 look, I was in LA in April. And I met with a bunch of millionaires who were making a ton of mistakes. And they had enough money to just be like, okay, here, I, I don't care, just pay it, right? But when you tell them the real calls, hey, you're overpaying by $23,872. Real number, right? You're overpaying this much, right? He could absorb that. But now let's think about regular people, just, just regular folks, regular, whether it be school teacher, fireman, government worker, just regular folks. Okay. You have a retirement account. People have like, okay, let's use 401ks or 403Bs if you're teaching. They have retirement accounts. They don't know how much money to put in their retirement account. Um, they don't know how they're getting taxed on their retirement account, when they're going to get uh, taxed, how much to take out. And they don't, and people don't realize without a financial advisor that you're paying more in taxes. Your cost of living is higher because you don't have a financial advisor. You don't have anybody to crunch the numbers for you. And uh, the, the clients that come in and they have their Excel spreadsheets and like, James, I know you're good, but you know, I have my, my Excel sheet says this. And then I have to ask them say, Hey, so uh, is, is your Excel sheet prepared for inflation? Inflation is 3% a year on average. Is, is your Excel sheet uh, uh, prepared for uh, life events, like a health event, you know, emergency, a baby, you know, God forbid it happens, a divorce. Is, is your Excel sheet ready for that? And many people are not prepared for those reality. So those people who choose, oh, no, I'm not going to talk to a financial advisor or I'm afraid or I feel like I don't have enough money are the same people who are going to be complaining when it's age 55, age 60, and they can't retire because they don't got enough money. Right? Cool. All right. Uh, next question. How much should we be saving to be, uh, I guess, to have a comfortable retirement fund? I'm sure that's that varies, right? It, 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 very, it varies greatly. Uh, I'll make a blanket statement, say as much as you can. Right. And then, and then diversify. Don't don't put it all in one in, in one in, in one pocket. Right. So everybody needs to have some liquid cash that you can get your hands on to. Um, and I, 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 I wouldn't put it all inside my checking account, right? That can get stolen. I can get robbed or whatever, you know, you know a savings account, you know, get yourself a really good, um, uh, high interest yield in online, uh, a banking account, right? Money goes into your, 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 your capital one or your Wells Fargo account, right? Good. Transfer it over. So now you can start making money on your money. Right. And here's a good rule of thumb. If you, if you have a hard time saying, okay, as much as possible, some people want more specific, right? If you work 40 hours a week, take one or two, one or two hours of that 40 hours a week and stash that, okay? Mm -hmm. just, just it. So it's, it's two ways. Now, many people with the Jewish philosophy, uh, or Orthodox Jew, 
uh, uh, Jewish communities, they say, okay, 20% we're stashing. 20% we're stashing. Well, it, either you do it that way or you say one hour, you know, how much do I get paid an hour? I get paid $20 an hour. Okay, so I'm gonna stash 20 or $40 a week away. Hmm. Boom. And if you think about it, if you don't work one hour during the week, you, you know, you're still gonna be able to eat. You're still gonna be able to pay your bills. And if you work an extra hour a week, you're not gonna go out and buy a Ferrari. So it, it, it's all relative. It's not going to hurt you. Just be consistent. Hmm. All right. Good. Good advice. Uh, next question. Is putting money into the stock market a good investment? You have to. Really? You have no choice. You have to. Right? I'll, get, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll put it like, um, I'll tell you this. Hey, I think I got this book I'm reading. One second. Mm -hmm. I read a lot. And this is this right here is my recommendation. I keep this in office right here. This book right here. I would teach you to be what? Rich. I'll teach you to be rich, right? He makes it pretty basic, but here's the whole point. Everybody needs for retirement, you need a retirement account. It's, it's an IRA. So either 401k, a 403b, a TSP, you need some type of individual retirement account. It's traditional. Traditional means it's tax deferred. So that means the money that you put in there, you could write off all your taxes today. Okay. Number two, you need a Roth account, meaning you already paid taxes on it, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's legal cash. It's just growing. When you go to pull it out, you, you, just, you don't get taxed on it because you already paid taxes on it. So all those gains for yourself. The qualified money, which is a traditional account, grows and you don't have to pay taxes on it. So interest is not disturbed. So your principal amount grows, 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 grows. And as the interest is earned, it's earned on the principal amount. Okay. Say that all to say is to excel your growth, to excel the amount of money that you're able to make and, and invest. And it is within a brokerage account. So a brokerage account can be uh, very diversified. I'm not going to get into all of that, uh, but just setting up a brokerage account that's money that's growing, 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 growing over and above what you're already putting inside of your personal retirement. Hmm. Cool. Yeah, it's uh, I've heard about Roth um, and everything. I had a, a friend at my, my last job was kept telling me, he's like, no, no, like this is the difference. And this is why you need to put something in this. Um, yeah, that's a that's a it's good to hear that reinforced. All right. Uh, next question. So this Can I give is you a... one, more, uh, one, one, more, one more thing on that. Yeah, People sure. have retirement accounts and, and when the life emergency happens, they have, they need money. So they pull out of those retirement accounts. When you pull out those retirement accounts too early, you get assessed a 10% fee plus the taxes that are, are immediately assessed to that account based upon your, your current tax bracket. So the reason why you want to Roth and the reason why you want to broker your account is because you can pull out that money in the event of an emergency. And at the worst case scenario, you're only paying capital gains tax. You're not paying, you know, earned income tax. Right. Or in some stock accounts, yeah, you are paying earned income tax. That's for your ta yeah, yeah, financial advisor. <laughs> um, getting awesome advice, man. Um, all right, so the next one was from Lulu again. He said his father's small business of over 25 years burned down earlier this year, and he didn't get any money for it, no insurance. He was also planning on retiring in two years. He's been selling his product from his house now, but can't really get back into a full business at his age and with the cost that it would incur. Do you have any suggestions um, for him? Heck yeah. If, 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 if he's been in business 25 years, it means he has a track record, which means he should have some form of business credit. So everything that he's doing right now, he can get a huge business loan use, using uh, uh, through alternative funding. Okay. Um, you can reach out to me. You can go to lasterfinancialgroup.com. I have that on my website. I got two websites at lasterfinancialgroup.com. You can go on there and it's talking about business funding and business credit. So make a long story short, depending on uh, it, it, uh, the criteria, how much money he needs and so forth, he can get a huge loan. Now, what would you use this loan for? Is to build up the business to be either sold, right? Or, or, or uh, yeah, well, basically to, to sell it as an asset 
or to continue to make it the amount of money that he needs out of the business so he can dissolve the business. But if he builds the business up so that he can sell it, that, that, that's, that's, that's a great route to go. Great route to go. Awesome. And and I did uh, put LasterFinancialGroup.com. I put the link on it in chat. So if you want to reach out, you can do it through there. All right. Next question. Uh, we only have two more left is, uh, do you work with people out of state, maybe through FaceTime or Skype? All the time. I, I have clients in India. <laughs> uh, I got clients in India, the Philippines, uh, 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 Japan, China. Um, we do a lot of things. Uh, that's why I'm in my office this evening. But, you know, we do a lot of things via Skype. Um, emails. Um, I try to do FaceTime because um, normally I'm driving, but and that's not safe. But yeah, absolutely. I, I do a lot of consultations um, via web. Awesome. Um, awesome. All right. Last question. Do you develop a budget for people like create an Excel spreadsheet? Um, I got something better than an Excel spreadsheet. Um, I, I, I have a proprietary uh, system that I use with all my clients. And how I use this proprietary system is that it takes in all of your accounts. It takes in everything that you just told me, you know, that you tell me through an evaluation period and it analyzes your entire situation, everything. So some people like looking at Excel spreadsheets. What I like providing is some of the items that Excel spreadsheet provides you but also an illustrative picture, whether it be bar graphs, whether it be a pie graph, uh, whether it be in written word. Uh, many people have an Excel sheet, but I, I, I have learned that an Excel sheet does not encompass your full financial picture. Yeah, data, data, I was, I've actually been, uh, I'm a, I work in programming and I did get into data visualization and it's a huge thing and it's a big deal. It's a great way to take a bunch of data and tell a story with it that people can just visually consume. Yeah. Um, I'm a, I'm a huge fan. I think, I think that offering that to your clients is a huge deal. I think it's, it's yeah. great. All right, man. So last thing, where can people find you and, uh, and, uh, yeah, where, where can they find you or do you, and you have any recommendations on books or anything, just go ahead and give your final, uh, your pitch here at the end for everybody. Oh, so I can be reached, uh, at lasterfinancial.com. Um, you can reach me, uh, directly email info at lasterfinancial.com. Um, all of my information uh, is on the website. Um, I'm scheduled to be in Dallas, Texas, and then Houston, Texas, uh, uh, speaking on stage at a progression conference on August uh, 23rd and 24th. Um, I'm also scheduled to be here in D.C. Um, uh, it, this all should be on the website in about a week or so. Um, everything's getting finalized. Uh, but I do travel. I do a lot of speaking engagements. I do a lot of fundraisers, uh, helping business owners build their business credit. Um, but I do a lot of estate planning, um, uh, this, this time of year, summer, I stay busy because, um, I'm working with families and their beneficiaries and updating the beneficiary forms and so forth. Mm -hmm. Um, so I stay busy, but enough about me. The, the, the biggest deal is about everybody who's out there, everybody who's listening, who's been listening this far. Look, you got a financial problem, whether you admit it or not, whether you know it or not, you got a financial problem. Right. How do I know that is because uh, some of the books that I have read have shared with me that people have a financial problem until their next generation is taken care of. Right. So if you read uh, a book that I recommend to a lot of people, especially the folks that I'm mentoring is Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. You don't got it. You got to get it. That every president, CEO, business professional, everybody's read rich and th uh, uh, um, think and grow rich. Um, the Millionaire Next Door, um, anything by Zig Ziglar. Um, th those are our positive mindset uh, um, uh, ideals, but th those two are, are super huge. Um, I'm, will, I'm reading right now, um, I Will Teach You to Be Rich. Um, I, the Jewish mil uh, Millionaire, uh, that's another uh, book that I, I, I've read uh, several times. 
Um, it's kind of explaining, you know, why are Jewish people rich? <laughs> um, you know, some people may not like Jewish people, whether you like them or not. I want to know why you have what you have. So <laughs> it's, 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 uh, it's truly awesome. Um, and uh, as cliche as it may sound, as cliche as it may sound, um, the Bible. Uh, specifically, um, uh, Deuter uh, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, Proverbs, and Psalms. If you don't read anything else right there, um, it's amazing to me that the Bible talks more about money than it does about, you know, uh, sins and, and anything else. It's, it's all about money, a bunch of business pra uh, uh, practices. Uh, I always encourage people, just, that's a good start right there, that list I just gave you. You can do that. You're, you're starting on the right track. Um, I do like Tony Robbins. Um, I'm working with a client um, who's hand in hand with Tony Robbins. So uh, a lot of what he's doing is, is really great. Uh, and if anything by Grant Cardone, you should be straight. You should be good to go. Awesome. Well, dude, thank you so much for coming on. It's been an absolute pleasure. I hope everybody watching this gets as much as I have. So uh, thank you again. And uh, we'll stay in touch, man. I mean, absolutely. Hey, I want to thank Common Dude, man. You guys are, are like awesome, man. This is this is great, man. I look forward to seeing what you guys are going to be at in the next year or two, three years, man. Awesome. Yeah, awesome. Awesome. Thanks so much, man. Well, I'll talk to you later. All right, man. Take it All easy. Right. Have a good one. Glazy. All good up in here. Right now in here with you. Personality. How was that?